When one is hungry and one sees others eating, one can become envious. But when one has had a very good dinner and sees others eating well, one takes pleasure in the gift of food. And so one is fulfilled. I think I've, I have a fulfilled life. And I think happiness is when you, your life is full. Her name was Sheila Rhodes. And so she had this reputation of being this dynamic speaker, philosopher, lecturer. And so I, probably my sophomore year, the end of my sophomore year, I decided to take her class, her intro to philosophy class. And uh, I, was, I was stunned. I was just stunned at how articulate, how insightful, and how energetic this woman was. And she was thinking thoughts I had never thought before. I remember sitting in that class watching her thinking, this could be a good life as a philosophy professor. Maybe, you know, one day you'd have a family, a dog. I wanted a house with a big kitchen that had a lot of wood in it and a big wooden table. And I'd have interesting friends who were poets and screenwriters and scientists. We'd talk and drink wine. That would just be such a life, you know? And we're sitting around the table where I live now. And he said, do you ever think life would turn out like this? And sure enough, I said, no, oh, man. I said, you know, all the working so much at City College, the commute, I've been writing scripts. And I stopped, I went, wait a minute, I'm in a big wooden kitchen. I'm at a big wooden table. I've got children running around here and a dog. I've been married and, oh my gosh, I'm the chair of the Department of Philosophy. I got my wish. <laughs> and, oh my gosh. And it, 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 it just stunned me that my dream came true. It's been about 34 years that I've been teaching in some capacity here at City College. When I first walked on campus, my first day as a tenured track professor, and I was the only one in the philosophy department at the time. They only had one full-time person, so I automatically became chair the first day. I remember walking and thinking, this is a great responsibility. I walked in and I went, this is my own classroom my own students, 1978. It's interesting to have lived through so much change at this school. What was fascinating back then compared to now, for example, is we were still using typewriters, and you just don't see those anymore, plus mimeograph machines. So there before computers, before anything like a laptop, anything like a photocopying machine, and there was really nothing on, East Cam on West Campus here. Everything was on East Campus, so we were in a little, uh, World War II temporary building. The student services building was the library. So I taught upstairs in the library. I was thinking about, you know, how many students do I think have been in my class? Because I, I taught large classes for 26 years. I'd have anywhere between 450 and 500 students a semester. And uh, it's close to 25,000 students. If you really care for these people at the deep level. As I said, you know, sometimes I watch ch these students taking exams, it's like watching a baby. I'm, I'm touched with that sense of tenderness and vulnerability and, you know, just innocence. And she comes over and she says, I was a student of yours last year and everything. I just wanted you to meet my parents. I go, oh, good, good, good. And I went over and I shook her father's hand and then her mother hugged me and whispered. She said, you know, you've saved my daughter. I have no idea what that means, but that was just so touching. I don't get a letter from a student that's been in your class 10 years ago. The one that came to me a couple years ago just started off, he said, you won't remember me. He said, I sat in the back of that big classroom in the administration building, and uh, I was kind of too cool to look like I was paying attention, so I had to kind of sit back there and like deal with other stuff, but I was listening. I was listening, and then I came around one day uh, to office hours, and so you were talking about this whole area of epistemology and how academics work to get at knowledge, and there's an effort involved here, and you need to learn a little logic and reasoning and all this. He said, I just started thinking about it, and then I took it seriously in class. So I decided to be a philosophy major, and I majored there at City College, and I transferred to Cal State, and I decided to go into counseling. And now I'm considered a professional. I'm a counselor and I have two kids. And I just want to thank you. And I want you, you probably already know this, but you know, sometimes it looks like we're not paying attention, 
but we pay attention. What has rang true for me and what I resonated with very early was the Greek notion that misfortune is rooted in ignorance. And given that misfortune is rooted in ignorance and that there is an antidote to ignorance, namely knowledge, the other model that, com that came to me via a philosopher by the name of Immanuel Kant was his remark that the philosopher David Hume had woken him from his dogmatic slumber. I think philosophers need to awaken students from their dogmatic slumber because within that slumber so often are we ignorant, either that we have mistaken beliefs or we're just oblivious and don't know what to think about things. Philosophy is very personal because it, it, it's your identity. You know, you, you largely identify in terms of things that you believe. There's this wonderful way of thinking about life and reflecting on life and people have done it so well. And if you could walk in their footsteps, you, you, you see things differently.